And welcome back to Broken Oars Podcast, or in this instance, the Broken Oars Sherlock Holmes Boat Race Special, which is a bit of a mouthful if you're ordering it at Starbucks. Holmes and Watson have been called from 22 1B Baker Street to investigate an apparent suicide at one of the Cambridge colleges. Inspector Lestrade has called them in. However, when they travel to Cambridge and they examine the room, they find young Mr. Martin dead, apparently from a single gunshot wound to the head. But Holmes has found a priest hole and a button. Does the priest hole mean anything? Does it mean nothing? Is the button just something that's been left there by one of the porters or one of the previous occupants of the room? Investigating further takes Holmes to the college boathouse, where he talks to a Mr. Pittman and a Mr. Muttlebury. Now, the rowers among you will recognise those names. They are famous boat race names. That is neither here nor there. In talking to Mr. Pittman and Mr. Muttlebury, Holmes learns some interesting things. He learns that young Mr. Martin had only just been awarded his seat in the Cambridge boat for the annual boat race, beating out a Lord Denby. And then he learns from Mr. Muttlebury the importance of every rower in an eight and how they contribute to the whole and how young Mr. Martin was the best man for the job of Bowor. Bowor, of course, being the most important role in the boat, despite what Stroke and Seven might tell you. They walk back to Cambridge in the fast-gathering twilight as the temperature drops, and Holmes ponders upon the role of sports in the British and English national psyche, and he ponders how young Mr. Martin's fate may be inextricably linked with those things. Is it something? Is it nothing? Well, of course it's something, otherwise it's not an adventure. Let's find out what in part six of The Mystery of the Murdered Bow. When I woke the next morning, Holmes was indeed gone. Our landlord had said he hadn't slept and had left before first light, heading for the river. As I breakfasted, a note reached me. The provost's office, it read. Ten sharp. It was from Holmes. I made my way to the college and was shown into the provost's study by Mr. Potter. Ah, Watson, said Holmes, looking keen. I'm glad you received my note. Provost Oak and Inspector Lestrade, you already know. And Mr. Potter, if you could stay, please, I have one further question for you. Very good, sir, replied Mr. Potter, bobbing his head. But I can't think of anything you didn't ask me yesterday. I can, Mr. Potter, and that I forgot is entirely my fault. I am only glad that I have an immediate chance to rectify it. Had I not remembered the one question I needed to ask, a murderer may well have gone free. Murder? gasped Provost Oakes, as Inspector Lestrade said, Now see here, Mr. Holmes. Murder, confirmed Holmes grimly, cutting them both off. Mr. Potter, I asked you if the room had been left unattended at any point, and you said, only briefly, when you went to raise the alarm. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, sir. When you came back from raising the alarm with the underporter, who has confirmed you asked him to send for both the police and the provost, was there any activity in the hall? Anyone else stirring or perhaps looking out to see what the commotion was? Porters are, by their very nature, solid and sensible fellows, responsible as they are for maintaining the basic order of their colleges and its inhabitants. Uh, well, "'Well, sir, I, I forced the door, and I came on the young gentleman, and I went to call for help. I made my way back as quickly as I could, sir, for I didn't want any one seeing, well, well, anyone seeing the young gentleman in such a state, sir. I can't have been gone for more than a minute or two. "'And was there anyone else in the room when you came back?' "'Well, uh, uh, no, sir. M- Mr. Martin was where I had found him. Uh, Lord Denby was at the door, though, sir.' He's a third year here from the floor below. He said he'd heard me calling for help and had come up to see what all of the commotion was. Holmes smiled in satisfaction. Tell me, Mr. Potter, was Lord Denby in the corridor standing at the door as if about to enter the room, or was he in the room as if he was about to leave it? Well, sir, I suppose now you mention it, he was standing just inside the room as if he were coming out. Thank you, Mr. Potter. 
I have one more task for you to perform. If you could ask Lord Denbeatty to attend to us at once, I would be most grateful. Holmes said nothing further until Lord Denby arrived a few minutes later. He looked pale but composed as he entered the room. Lord Denby, said Holmes, thank you for coming. I have just one question to ask. Why did Mr. Potter come on you in Mr. Martin's rooms yesterday morning? Why, said Lord Denby, I'd heard the commotion, heard Potter shouting, and I'd uh, come upstairs. When I saw George in that state, why, I suppose I must have stepped in to see if I could help. But the poor soul was beyond saving. That would uh, no doubt wash, said Holmes, turning to Lestrade, would it not? If I were to say to you, however, that Mr. Potter bumped into you in the doorway of Mr. Martin's rooms, Lord Denby, because you were in the moment of slipping out of the priest's hole, intending to make your way to your own rooms in order to be found there when news of Mr. Martin's death spread, what would your response be? Rather than look guilty or angry, Lord Denby looked amused. I'd say you'd been reading too many detective novels, Mr. Holmes. George was my friend and crewmate. I've no reason to wish him ill, let alone murder him. Except he wasn't your crewmate, was he, Lord Denby? Two days ago, Mr. Pittman told you that you had been dropped from the boat race in favour of Mr. Martin, hadn't he? He confirmed this morning that he went to your rooms on the last night that Mr. Martin was seen alive to tell you himself, which is what a conscientious captain would do, is it not? He did, confirmed Lord Denby stiffly, and I admit that I was disappointed, but I was happy for George. He'd earned his seat. Disappointed, said Holmes coldly. You were more than disappointed. You were seething. Oh, I know on the face of it you took it well. Mr. Pittman said that you shook hands on you. How could you not? We breed our ruling classes in this country to put away all emotion. It's why games and sport became so important after Arnold died. What does cricket teach us but the stiff upper lip and the straight bat? What does rowing teach us if not the subordination of the individual to the good of the collective? Yet inwardly, your blood boiled, didn't it? Your father is sending you off to the Argentine next year, I believe. Your father who won a blue for rowing like his father before him. I am going to the Argentine at the end of this year to take up my family's concerns. Yes, Mr. Holmes, replied Lord Denby carefully. So, this would be your last year to take your blue and feature in the boat race, a race your father not only won but captained. You've been working for three years to make this crew. You've nearly made it last year, and but for Spanish flu, you probably would have. And here comes Mr. Martin, fresh to the college. He's not in your class of terms of blood, is he? But he's more than your match as an oarsman. It may have been nip and tuck, but a captain's duty is to the boat, is it not? Mr. Pittman had to pick the combination that he thinks will win between Putley and Mortlake. So after you've all you've done, despite of all of your work... You are out, and Mr. Martin is in, and your chance to uphold your family tradition and your family honour is gone. Lord Denby flushed at this, but his voice was even when he spoke. Well, uh, that's an admirable theory, Mr. Holmes, but as you say, if rowing teaches us anything, it's that the individual bows to the good of the collective. I was happy for Mr. Martin. He deserved the seat. Now see here, Mr. Holmes, began Lestrade again. But Holmes was pushing on inexorably. E Even though you knew it would deny you a blue, a blue that you felt was your birthright. Why? Because you were expected to get one. Pittman has confirmed that your father's triumph was never far from his lips or yours, and so too his disappointment that you found such difficulty achieving what he had done so easily. I have had enough practice at accommodating my father's disappointment, Mr. Holmes, Lord Denby said stiffly. I'm sure that I'll be able to live with a little more. I imagine he will shortly be living with his disappointment that his son turned out to be a murderer. Mr. Holmes, exploded Lestrade, but Holmes pressed on. You came to Mr. Martin's rooms the other night ostensibly to congratulate him. Maybe you planned it, or maybe it was on the spur of the moment, but either way you shot him from behind. If you left then, it was murder. But if you locked the door from the inside and Mr. Martin was discovered alone the next morning, well, then it was suicide. So you locked the door and waited. 
You knew of the priest's hole. Provost Oak has confirmed that these cubby holes are widely known about and used in the college. You knew that the hue and cry would be raised the next morning once Mr. Martin's body was discovered. And you counted on hiding in and then using the time between Mr. Martin being discovered and the alarm being raised to return to your own rooms. When Mr. Potter came back unexpectedly, you had to brazen it out, which you did with the same cold-blooded nerve you displayed in staying all night next to the body of the man you had killed. And you did all of this because you knew that with Mr. Martin out of the way, the bow seat would revert to you and thus get you one last chance at earning your blue. I thought it was Dr. Watson who was responsible for spinning your yarn, said Lord Denby coldly. But having met you, I can see that you are more than capable of doing it yourself. Mr. Holmes," said Lestrade, this is an admirable theorising, but with our evidence there's nothing to support it. True, true, Lestrade," nodded Holmes grimly. If it were not for this... And Holmes produced with infinite care and slowness the brass waistcoat button that he had found on the floor of the priest's hall. If you look, you will see it has the family crest embossed upon it. I doubt that there are any others elsewhere in Cambridge but on Lord Denby's person or in his wardrobe. Mr Potter, when you ran into him in the doorway, can you remember if Lord Denby was in full dress or shirt and waistcoat? Why, uh, now I come to think of it, he was in shirt and waistcoat, sir. I presume he'd been in the act of changing when he'd heard the commotion and come up to see what the shave was. And that would be his defence, no doubt, in a court of law. If it were not for in his wardrobe, you will find a waistcoat with a missing button, second from top. He maybe has already asked his bedder to mend it, no matter. In seizing his chance to make good his escape, Lord Denby caught it on the bottle rack as he brushed past, which pulled it free. In the scramble to get out before anyone else came back, he did not notice this. He knew that when Mr. Martin's body was discovered, the alarm would be raised. He had banked on being able to return to his chambers without being seen in that moment. When Mr. Potter returned with admirable speed, Lord Denby had to fake coming to see what all of the commotion was about. "'You got all of this from a waistcoat button,' said Lestrade incredulously. "'No. My suspicions were first aroused when I examined the body.' Watson, do you remember anything amiss when you examined Mr. Martin's body yesterday? Uh, why no, Holmes, sir. Mr. Martin was dead. The cause of death was one gunshot wound to the head, and the weapon was by his left hand. Thank you, Watson, smiled Holmes thinly. His left hand, Lestrade. Provost Oak, Mr. Martin was right-handed. A specimen of his handwriting will confirm what Mr. Muttlebury told me at the boathouse yesterday. Mr. Martin was a natural bowsider. His left hand is all very well for squaring and feathering and what have you, but it is his right hand that links the chain. His dominant hand was his right. It does not make sense for a man to shoot himself in the left temple using his left hand when he is naturally right-handed, does it? Why, you'd expect the bullet wound to be in the right temple and the exit wound in the left, I exclaimed. Exactly, Watson. I should have seen it straight away. I blame myself for missing it. And the entry rune was not fully in the temple, was it, Watson? It was almost behind and above the left ear, suggesting that he was shot from behind. Lord Denby is also a bowsider. His right hand is his dominant one. He had to make it look like suicide, but he also had to get his shot off without arousing Mr. Martin's suspicions. I would suggest that at some point during their conversation, Lord Denby got up to fill his glass. That would have meant walking over to the occasional table behind Mr. Martin. Once there, he had his time and leisure to place his shot. The mistake that he made was shooting him on the left side. The second mistake was leaving the gun on the left side next to Mr. Martin's left hand also. His third was not noticing that he had torn a waistcoat button when he exited the priest hall. Had he walked a few steps further and taken the logical shot, I have no doubt that these details would not have been noticed in all of the blood and commotion. We may have found the priest's hole, we may have found the waistcoat button, and it all might have easily been explained away without the other links we have established. Lord Denby might well have been walking away today to travel to London to take his place in a boat that now desperately needs another rower. But we have these links. And now, 
I will leave it with you, Lestrade. If you need anything else, you will remember that Provost Oak noted when we first met that he told us that Mr. Martin did not possess a gun. Lord Denby does. He shoots for the college at the range. His pistol is a top break Webley, the one that we found next to Mr. Martin. <sighs> I gasped. The pieces were slotting into place. Exactly, said Holmes grimly. You will recall how they spit from the back when fired, Watson? I do, Holmes. If you check his right hand, Lestrade, you will find a powder burn between the groove of the forefinger and the thumb that cannot be explained by rowing blisters. And with these links in place, I leave it with you, for you have your murderer. Lord Denbury covered his right hand, as much an admission of guilt as revealing them. And with that, Holmes turned to Lestrade. There's no need to include myself or Watson in your report, Lestrade. This is a nasty, distasteful business all round. All of the credit, such as it is, goes to yourself and to Scotland Yard. <sighs> it does, sir, and I thank you for taking an interest. I would have stuck with my earlier conclusion had you not happened along. A suicide is a terrible thing, but then so is murder, sir. Knowing it was murder and not self-harm will bring his family little comfort, but at least they'll know that the killer has been brought to justice. Lestrade turned to Lord Denby, and placing handcuffs on him, begin to intone. Lord Denby, I'm arresting ye for the murder of Mr. George Martin, as Holmes and I left the provost's study. Part 7 whether the family received the comfort Lestrade alluded to or not is impossible for me to say. He certainly did not receive it from justice being done. Had Lord Denby been from a Whitechapel slum or a Somerset village, he would have swung. But his father, though old, was both rich and influential. Words were spoken in the right places, and the murderer escaped the just noose, being instead shipped, as had been planned, to the Argentine on the strict proviso that he would never return to England, and that after an amount of time had passed, his unfortunate death would be announced, with the title of one of England's oldest and most noble families passing to the younger son. British justice is, I believe, generally the best in the world, but it is not immune to the strange currents and circuits of influence that swim around and through even the most venerable of our institutions. On the day of the boat race, about a month later, Holmes surprised me by suggesting we walk down to watch the spectacle. We did so with the crowds on Hammersmith Bridge. On the day, Cambridge won by two-thirds of a length, beginning a streak of winds that they would sustain for the next four years. We walked home from the river more thoughtful than satisfied, and later that evening, surprisingly to us, there was a knock at the door. It was Mr Pittman and Mr Muttlebury, both looked flushed and rather done in, which was to be expected after such exertions, after such a tumultuous time. Uh, "'Sorry to call in, Mr. Holmes,' began Mr. Pittman. Uh, "'Not at all, not at all,' said Holmes, rising and shaking his hand. "'Well done today.' Uh, "'Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It was, uh, it was a tight race. But if I'm honest, uh, if I'm honest, well, yes,' said Holmes, lighting his pipe, a cloud of smoke billowing up at the touch of his match. Mr. Pittman glanced at Mr. Muttlebury, who nodded and continued. Well, uh, it, it's like this. You might think me fanciful, Mr. Holmes, but I think Mr. Martin got us through today. Coming to Hammersmith Bridge, we were done. But Baker, our cock, showed nerve he never has before, and we shot the bridge abreast with inches to spare. Oxford had us, though, and they pulled away in the rough water beyond. Between Chiswick and Barnes Bridge, they must have made about two lengths of us. Then Baker made a call, said Pittman, taking up the account. He yelled, For Mr. Martin, boys, pull him home! I don't know about Mutty here, but I found strength I didn't know that I had then, Mr. Holmes, and I pulled beyond anything I ever had before, or anything I think I ever will since. It was inch by inch, and none of it was pretty, but by the time the line came, we were two-thirds up. I had to be told, because by that point I wasn't aware of anything in this world. But we'd won. We'd won, and I believe Mr. Martin got us home. Holmes smiled. I do believe you're right, Mr. Pittman. The human being is capable of more than his mind knows and his body understands in the right circumstances. Isn't that so, Watson? Uh, well, of course, I said. 
Soldiers who uh, carry their comrades back to the lines without realising they've been shot themselves. Sailors who plunge into the stormy deeps after a shipmate and make it back when no one would have thought possible. Parents who rush back into burning buildings to rescue their child and emerge miraculously unscathed. Pittman fumbled in his pocket. It's, uh, it's Mr. Martin's blue, he explained. I thought you might like to keep it as a memento of his case, Mr. Holmes. He did make the boat today, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure of it. I'm sure he was in there with us. Holmes took it, a tight, understanding smile on his face. You know, Mr. Pittman, we speak of sporting immortality easily nowadays, he said, turning over the scrap of cloth in his hands. We speak of pantheons of immortal heroes, grace in cricket, yourselves today. But the thing I find most noble and sacred about sports and games are not the medals and the trophies and the ribbons and the caps. They're not the achievements, who won, who lost. We think these are the landmarks. These are the Himalayan peaks. These are our lasting legacies. They are not. No medal yet struck, no cap or blazer yet made. Riley, indeed. No words ever yet written ever meant more than a human life well lived. The glory is not in the medals and the trophies. Next year, someone else will win your race. Someone else will strike the winning runs or take the crucial wicket. What you have done today, what we all do today, it slips into the past, and no record of it can capture the moment of its doing. No, my dear fellows, the glory is in having took part, and in doing so, in stretching every muscle and sinew and every fibre of our being, having been for those few moments gloriously alive. That is the value of these activities. I will take this memento, and I will remember. If you truly wish to honour your dead brother in arms, the best thing you can do is, yes, remember him, yes, celebrate what you have achieved today. But never let it get in the way of living as fully and gloriously as you possibly can for the rest of what I hope and trust will be long and happy lives. Mr. Pittman bobbed his head. It looked for a moment as if Mr. Muttlebury would speak, but the words would not come. Instead, they proffered their hands and we shook them warmly and gladly, and then they left. Whether they lived the long and happy lives that Holmes wished for them, I cannot say. Both slipped from our view. But I could not help thinking, as Holmes picked up his violin and placed it under his chin, that for all his professed distance from it, my friend had the right of it when it came to what it meant to be human. And that concludes our boat race special, commissioned and written for Broken Oars Podcast by Broken Oars Podcast the only Sherlock Holmes story in existence to feature the glorious and wonderful sport of rowing. We hope you've enjoyed it and we hope that you spread it around and pass it to all of your friends and say it was a cracking read or listen. And if any of you work for the BBC, you should really commission it in time for next year's boat race along with a companion piece featuring Oxford. <laughs>